Hey guys, welcome back. This is Code Red Rules, and today we're going to be doing some Limit Hold'em. Uh, my first Limit Hold'em video, I, I went and played four tables live, and then my second table, my second, my second video, I did, a, I did a, as a lecture video. And so now I'm going to go back and do some more live play. And here we are at Full Tilt Poker, twenty-five cent, fifty cent uh, blinds. Uh, just go ahead and getting a a feel for these games. Looks like the the action's gonna be pretty pretty good. Um, so far, I've seen a lot of the common mistakes that I've drawn out in my older video. Uh, a lot of cold calling going on. A lot of missed value bets. A lot of. I really haven't seen anybody over calling the river yet. But like, there's a lot of bad players here would cold call this ten nine suited hand. I mean, it just looks really good to play. Like you're gonna win a big pot and. A lot of times annulment players go and they play limit hold'em. They like playing these hands as they misrepresent the value they receive. Also, I see a lot of players still called calling pocket pairs. So uh, right now, if I see like a, a solid type player or someone who's got taggy type stats, maybe twenty ten, someone who almost has a clue to know what he's doing in this game. When you see him cold calling, it's most likely a, a pocket pair of some sort. So, um, in, in a way, this game is a lot like No Limit in that you have to give your opponents ranges. Um, right here, I'm going to go ahead and raise my ace check out of position because I believe that I beat my opponents under the gun limping range. Which is then, give me, you know, he just go ahead and check folds a flop. So he just misses completely. So I got an extra half a big blind out of him. So like I was saying, I'll, I'll, this is a very similar to, to No Limit in that once you are able to give your opponent a range here, uh, like my opponent's three betting range here, I'm assuming is probably like nines or better and ace-king and probably ace-queen. So we're going to play our hand accordingly. Given the fact that he has ace-king and ace-queen hand in his range, I'm going to go ahead and play it that way. I'm going to be very suspicious of what this guy called a bet and a raise with. Uh, I'm assuming the opponent's going to be c-betting 100% of his range here, given, and I don't sort of know what big blind hand's going to have. Uh, given that he went ahead and fired twice into, th into two people, uh, it's, it's a bit tough to say if he has ace-king still. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call him. Oh, now we can go ahead and fold pretty easily. Let's see how accurate my range is of jacks are better. Yeah, he had jacks, and so the reason why I, I was saying it's all about range is okay. So if he has ace king and ace queen, and then uh, if he re raises somebody with like nines are better, or we can even say jacks are better. It's actually better if he has a, if he has a tighter range. There, and it's about combinations too. So knowing in your head that there are six combinations of each pair, that's twenty four cards. And there are 16 combinations of each of each over card. We're gonna go ahead and three bet this guy. Given that there's yeah 16 of each over card, so there's 16 of these ace king and 16 of ace queen, then he's more likely to have ace king and ace queen there than he is jacks or better. Um, on the all under card board like that, he, we know that he's going to make at least one barrel. And this our opponent here is gonna be four betting us. Again, a very similar range of jacks are better and ace king. Um, we're pretty much regularly to go to showdown now. Once he checks, uh, I'm assuming that we're going to have the best hand unless he's slow playing aces and kings. Which, if he is, then we're going to get a check raise out of him pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm assuming he had pocket queens there, or a hand like pocket jacks. He played that very similarly. But. A hand. Okay, so there's 32 combinations of over cards and 24 combinations of over pairs. Now it's just a matter of, be, of doing odds. Uh, so he's already like he's already more likely that he has an, the over cards than he has the over pairs. So we're ahead versus that range. Now, even if he only two barrels ace king, uh, well, actually, it's a matter of how often does he value, but. Or is it a two barrel ace king as compared to value betting jack through aces? Uh, given our pot odds on the turn to call, we were getting, what was it like one, two, three, 
the pot of 375. So we were getting 7 to 1 to call on the turn, and he's betting. He's going to be betting 100% of the time the 24 combinations for value. So that pretty much means that he only has to be bluffing or be two barreling the ace king one and really one and seven right and so not really make so he needs to do about three combinations of the of the ace king so about ten percent I think uh, if, get, get me right here ten percent of the time that he has ace king or ace queen there in that spot that he's got to two barrel it for our in order for our call to be correct on the turn so gives given our pot odds uh, we ha we have to uh, call the turn bet. I have seen a lot of people uh, calling raises and then uh, check folding the flop lot, which is kind of interesting for me. Now we can go ahead and talk about some things. Uh, Re-raising here the MP raiser with uh, ace queen is a little bit marginal. I'm not going to deny that it was a completely standard, but given I think that he's opening a fairly wide range and we have position on him, we can afford to do so. Plus he didn't buy in for a full uh, at least 25 big, 25 big blinds. I don't think that he's all that solid. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be isolating him more. And once he, the great thing about Limit Hold'em is that a lot of players give away their hands. And, well, and it's almost correct to do so. If you can put it someone's range and, and solely on Ace-King and, and Jacks are better, you can play pretty solidly against that range and just using pot outs to your favor and then make call downs in those regards. We're going to be folding your 8-3 off soon. And the 6-4. I made a... The, the last video I made with the lecture topics went over some mistakes. You know, the cold calling, uh, pre-flop, uh, the over calling the river, not value betting enough, um, you know, sea betting too much, although that's probably not that prevalent here. I did call down a guy earlier for two barrels when he showed down Ace King. I'm trying to think if I can show you guys that hand. I've been playing these games for a little bit. Maybe it was on the other table. I'm trying to think of what table it was. And we're just going to go value, 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 value. We're expecting any flush out of call, aces to raise, given he overlimped. Well, given he overlimped, there's only like one other ace out there. So ace jack is a possibility. One of these guys has to have the flush draw because I have the other ace. I'm not going to be pumping it up. Ace, ace. Now we only split with other aces, which is quite annoying. What is going on here? I don't believe I'm ahead anymore, guys. I. I don't know if he could have had pocket. Actually, he could have pocket fours. One of these guys could have the straight. I really don't see how I'm any good here anymore. The best I can do is split it. There's only one other ace out there. And I'm just trying to think of what I beat here. And I can't think of anything. So I'm going to have to make a really crappy lay down. Fours. Yeah, and the other guy who's... I don't know what the other guy was waiting for, raising the river with what, the straight? Oh, horrible King Jack. I I don't even know how he even thought King Jack was even relevant. He's got like middle two pair. He doesn't even, he has, oh wow. I, luckily this guy's turn raise maybe uh, saved me quite easily. I don't know what he was doing, even calling the, the bet and the raise on the turn. So definitely these games are, are, are very good. As I would expect them to be, I was not expecting that hand at all. I play a lot of no limit now. Uh, well, I've as obviously as you guys can probably tell from my no limit videos. So it always it's it's fun coming back here and, and watching the limit hold'em videos and and playing limit hold'em again and coming back. There's actually specific ways that limit hold'em can even help your no limit game. Uh, it's more specifically draws and and odds like if you're if you're really if you're, if you're if you're not that heavy on the odds part and the draws part on and no limit go ahead and play some go and play some limit hold'em and 
you'll be surprised like you'll be surprised at like some hands where you're glad that you're able, that you're playing limit on and there's going to be other hands where you wish you were playing no limit on and and actually playing limit hold them sits there and, and allows you to identify those scenarios we could blind seal this up i do i do recommend doing a lot of isolating in the full ring games uh, here at the at limit hold them i feel like if you can raise the blinds out of the pot and get it heads up with the guy who opened limps. Putting him on a range is uh, becomes much easier than trying to put two players on ranges, especially when you're trying to balance them against each other. Let's see what else. Uh, I was uh, I, I tried co contacting uh, ASD Pikes from FTR again, and uh, well, not again, but we have been in talks about him doing a couple limit holding videos for Grinder School, and I'm. I'm enthusiastic about that idea, as I think another perspective from Limit Hold'em for more for more current days, I feel would be a great addition to F to uh, to Grinder School if you could get him from FTR. I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on that, or or what you guys think of him. But the the video the I got I've gotten a test video from him, and the one that I the one that I've watched seems like it's going to be uh, a. Pr He's going to be a pretty solid limit hold'em instructor. So, not that I'm not happy doing limit hold'em videos for you guys, but I feel like someone who plays the game 100% currently, right now, can give you guys a lot more information than I am. I'm going to go ahead and re-raise. I'm definitely re-raising H4LB, which I'm trying to think if that's kind of leads bigger. Like how? Dicker, I, I have no idea. Now, in a common full ring games with a higher stakes, this would be a four betting hand. Uh, I actually expect this guy to try to make a play on me here somewhat. Uh, hey, hey, flush, draw. Let's give us pretty much two barreling rights. Um, we're gonna go ahead and now check fold this river because the flush draw got there, and he's calling us any pair. Wow, he didn't even re-raise queens. That's a pretty pretty sick just call down he could have gotten so much value out of us th that he missed he could have raised pre-flop we probably would have had the check call the flop once and then once we get the flush on the turn we're, so he's he probably missed a good maybe one bet from us at least he could have raised the turn on us and waited to raise the turn that would have been the probably the best way to get the extra half bet at finally from from me rather Sevens, I believe, is the lowest pocket pair uh, you should be raising under the gun. Let me go ahead and consult the Bible of Limit Hold'em games, as in small stakes hold'em. There we go. Just pass the hand chart now. Early position. Yep. Oh, no. Raises is actually tens are better. But it says I should limp in sevens. Not a big fan of the limping in of the sevens, though. I mean, I guess it's okay. It's not necessarily going to be a bad play. It's not as bad as it would be in Null and Hold'em. I top pair. And we'll go ahead and not be too spewing. We're going to go ahead and... If he raises us here, we're going to have a decision to make. As we really aren't drawn to hold too much. And given that he open limped an early position and then raises the turn. We well, don't have that great of a hand. I mean, we don't have a kicker. So if we had like an, an ace as a kicker, something that we could bank on for maybe hitting two pair, then we should probably call. But given that we only had four hot kicker, we we can't we have to we have to freeze to a, to a raise even though how annoying it would be. Man, I I want to raise these suited connectors up so bad. I'm not lying. I should probably rebuy. When to rebuy and, and limit hold them? You just got to make sure you have 12 big bets, which 12 times 50 cents would be $6. So we didn't have to rebuy at that time, but I felt like I want to be baller and I want to get an extra $5 on my stack. There were times where I would sit with 50 big blind stacks. I'm talking about like thinking, you know, there was. You had 
a, a monster stack sitting down with 50 big blinds. It wasn't until I played live until I realized how how ridiculous a 50 big blind stack is when you're playing limit hold'em. When I mean, the worst you're gonna lose in one hand is 12, and that's if you if you cap every street. This guy's a nine to three. All right, we're gonna go ahead and bump it up. If you find yourself in some really tight games, and in some ways it says these guys are really tight, and that that they're not re-raising pocket queens pre-flop, or they're not re-raising, or they're not even going for value on a lot of flops, then I would definitely start going to blind stealing. And if you find players that are that passive, then don't even don't really don't worry about too much about getting bluffed and making loose cutouts with hand like ace high. That that's the reason why I was not gonna check call the river with with the with the bear ace there. I had felt like that the, once the flush draw gets in, there's really not much going on there that that I that I beat. Uh, there's a chance that he's calling down with some kind of straight draw and he's gonna be bluffing the flush draw. But I believe of all his value betting ranges there, a bluff is not very likely. Even if he has a hand, like, like I said, even if he had pocket queens there, he wasn't betting it because he was afraid of the flush. Once you once I checked him though on that river, he should be value betting queens all the way all town. I probably bet the queens out there because it's pr it's very likely that I have I don't have the flush, and that's really the only thing he's worried about. Blind versus blind like that. I was actually doing some research and going over some of my old threads on F on FTR. If you want to find some interesting plays on on blind play, go ahead and just do a, a search a forum search for posts made by B posts made by me and just have the title like blind fence on them and you're finding a lot of interesting material in there from between myself and Nord and and Niemer and some of the other old limit holding pros that used to go back and forth a lot and Kumo uh, from FTR and those were the good old days for me going back and reminiscing but there's a lot of good information in there if you guys are wanting some some limit holdem knowledge I don't know if there's I don't know if we can muster enough uh, interest up to get a, the limit hold'em article going uh, this is another spot where we would re-raise the a6 for value Let's see is this guy gonna like see you know if this guy re-raises me I'm gonna have like no idea where he's at because he already cold called Queens and so the re-raise is almost ultimately gonna be a hand like pocket aces although his stats are quite confusing quite confusing I probably won't be blind stealing with this garbage hand, King Five. Now, if we had a tighter opponents, or maybe if, they, if it was suited, then I'd be more lucky to blind steal. You guys should really be blind stealing a lot in these games when you're playing limit hold'em. If if they if they give you the right to, then I would pr pretty much go to town. Players that that see this guy here calling in the small blind has a pretty wide range. It's tough for me to now balance two ranges off each other and. The fact that we have a gut shot pre means we're gonna try and make it to the river as cheaply as possible. Let's see, well, what's he leading here? Can I can I raise for a free card? Not really with a gut shot. If I had Jack Queen, I'd raise for the free card. And if re two check races is here, I would almost certainly think that he has some sort of some sort of king. It's not a really uh, not an excellent spot to check raise for. What, do we have a seven, eight, nine, ten Jack? So we have a double gutter now, and if our opponent's checked to us on the river, we're gonna go ahead and bet it. Hi gutter. And if he three bets us, we won't be four betting. So he was betting all three streets with a hand with with the ten, which. I'm trying to think about it, given my range, isn't it? the river bet call was what is what was his downfall, I believe. I don't mind the flop lead and the turn lead, but once he by betting the river, he doesn't do anything. Like, I'm not folding any hand that 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 beats him, when he's not getting any value out of a worse ten. Uh, he did get some value out of me though on the on the flop and on the turn, but we can go ahead and go back through some of the odds. There, uh, which we put in two dollars on the river, so I was like two seventy-five on the turn, and I was getting four and a half to one on the turn to call with double gutter. That's pretty good odds. In fact, 
I even had my jackouts too. So I I had two jackouts to split the pot. So that, that gives me ten odd, ten outs, twenty percent chance of winning. Uh, I need four to one without implied. What it, what eventually happened was I got four to one plus I got an extra two two implied. So I, I did get six to one. So I was getting good odds to call with my open and strike draw or double gutter rather. And on the flop, the pot was a dollar fifty, and he bet twenty five cents. And do we want it? We'll just overlap the eights. And so we were getting seven to one on a, to call with our gut shot in the flop, which is more than enough to on pot odds alone. We're not counting the implied odds. If you count the implied odds, we were actually getting thirteen to one to call. That in, that is including the two bets on the river plus the one bet on the turn. So and times two because we're talking about small blinds. So it was a pretty good call by us on the on the flop too. All right, let's hope for an eight. No eight. And yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and fold. We can get ourselves into a big mess here if we keep calling off one bet at a time. I don't know what this guy would open limp and then call the raise and the raises flop. But other than ace queen, oh, he's pretty tight. It's possible he has ace queen here. If I have aces, I'm probably three betting aces. Although I am kind of worried about this player. The th when you want to be aggressive, though, uh, when to test out the strength of your hand is on the flop, as that's when it's generally the cheapest to do so. And we're just gonna f well, let's go ahead and open up the threes. It's, it's pro this is not grammatically correct in a in the SSH tight game, but. We might be able to make it a loose game here. We got one, two, three, four. Eh, sure, why not? Let's raise it up. So this player raised the flop with the sevens, which is kind of interesting. Didn't expect that one bit. And then this player had the jack three suited. He had the flush draw, and I think he put the, I think the flush draw played it okay, other than not calling pre-flop probably. The sevens made a very marginal raise, and uh, it was pretty effective because it raised my eights out of the pot. And I certainly didn't expect the the tight player thirteen five to do that. Although I had a hard time really putting him on the queen after open limping. So it was quite interesting. This guy's lead was very much so the draw. I actually, it's a, it's a really good point. Players are going to be leading the draws a lot more. So if he gets multi-way, they could bet three, bet them. And really, when you're winning the draws, there you're just trying to build the pot and give yourself an opportunity to make a, to to win a big pot. And what do we want to do? Do we want to check? We'll let him call. I guess we're going to go ahead and bet. I think if he calls our flop bet, we're going to give up on the turn. Yeah, this was just what I kind of want. I I didn't want to get stuck too much, and using our glorious headsets, he looks like he's pretty passive. But we have very little equity, so I'm just going to go ahead and fold. If it was a raised pot and I had bottom pair, I'd probably be more willing to go with it, given how short he is of only four big blinds. But by betting out there, I kind of give myself uh, uh, an option to fold when he does raise. But we're going to go ahead and re-raise him here and attempt to get it in against him eventually post-flop one half bet at a time. Yeah, I switched him to make a buck and then I'm just going to lead into him on any flop. Do 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 do. I actually expect that queen to hit him. Yeah. So we get unlucky there when he get the queen. The reason why I said I expect the queen to hit him was because did I forbid him? I re raise he made it twenty okay. I actually put him on ace queen and not king queen. Uh, I could have gone ahead and check raise the flop, but I felt I just wanted the quickest way to get it all in would mean be to bet three bet. I wasn't I'm not giving him too much credit. Uh after the kind of the way he's played. It's given the fact he only has like four big blinds and or I'm sorry, four big bets and uh, you know, bet through betting. I have ace king and I'm not I'm not actually folding. 
And I got, and I got a good value out of my hand. Uh, I got most of the money in while I was ahead, with an exception to the last ninety cents that we put in. So I feel pretty good about that. And this is a goofy, a goofy board. Okay, so we have the second pair and a gut shot. We're gonna get popped by the nut flush a lot. Nut nut flush draw a lot. Trying to buy a free card. So and because he's also got like an over car and he's got a gut shot and he's got all these other combo draws that uh, if he has the ace of diamonds he should almost certainly be raising with. And so if we got raised there, I probably wouldn't be folding to the one bet and I'd be trying to find out what's going to happen on later streets. I like the two tables videos uh, in this instance a lot more than the four tables. Let's see, this was limped pot. Eh, I'm going to go ahead and value bet it. We could check raise the top runner kicker, but it's only four way. The pot isn't that big. And I assume somebody with king queen is going to would have raised. Now that we have the open end straight draw, I am worried about a hand like jack queen. Um, but we have the straight now. Ten queen offsuit. It's just is almost a uh, consult SSH type of hand. So while I do that, I'm not saying that I know everything when it comes to limit hold'em, but thankfully I have the option here. Where we are in. Nope, it's still a fold. If it was suited, we would. If it was suited, we would be raising it. Although they do, what do you call? It? Small six hold'em says we should be limping in there with a hand like queen ten, which is kind of interesting. Oh, that's that's the loose stake games. I'm sorry. No, that's still the guideline, huh? Odd. I would think that if. Uh, no one's played, then I would just ra I'd be raising up to Broadway's. Although it's not a very strong hand, I think if the blinds are pretty tight, I'd like to raise it up a lot more than I would have. But not necessarily that fond of open limping in middle position like that. Although maybe I'm misreading the the little hand chart that SSH so graciously so that I so relied on when I was first learning limit hold'em. But looking back, it seems like it's been it was forever ago that I even played Limit Hold'em. It feels really weird. I'm not gonna deny. Not well, not really feels weird playing. It just thinking back about it, how I was so into to Limit Hold'em, and now I barely even think about it. You know, I played some of the F Tops events, but. Some of these games are kind of fun. They, I, I like Limit Hold'em sometimes because it helps your range building a lot more. I find that when you're playing against regs, their ranges are actually more concrete than they would be in No Limit Hold'em. Uh, good players aren't going to be cold calling raises with hands like you know, 7 8 suited in Limit Hold'em, whereas they would and they could have them in their range in. Uh, no limit hold him. And so when you see like a good reg actually cold calling you, it's very likely that he doesn't have a suited connector. So on like a 6 5 4 uh, two tone flop when he raises you, whereas in no limit he could have anything from two pair set uh, combo draw. In, in limit hold him, it's more likely that he just has either he still played an over pair on you or he's just got a flush draw because he's not. He knows that he can't really cold call preflop profitably with two connectors. Now, in the blinds is a different story, but I'm talking about in these games where players really know how to play and they're only cold calling and they're they're usually playing a very specific range of hands. Now, how you get to know what your player is cold call with is really up to you, but it's kind of research that you have to do. And in fact, you have to do the same research in no limit. It doesn't change anything. I think a lot of the smaller stakes players believe that 
um, know that players are just good, or the good players just sit there and they just know how to play every hand, every situation. And in fact, it, there's a lot of studying involved. A lot of work goes in into being able to to play certain hands correctly, and a lot of the times the scenarios are similar. I'm gonna go ahead and fold the jack six suited. As we're getting barely over three to one, and if and if you remember from our last lecture, that would be a pretty easy fold with a hand like an off with a random crappy jack. I am a little hesitant to do a six max video. I haven't played. I've played full ring limit hold'em more than I have played six max limit hold'em in the past couple of years. Since uh, I I left it to be a no limit player, and switching to six max from a from a full ring game requires quite a bit of an adjustment. First off, like everybody's everybody's ranges are going to be extremely wider. Um, top pair becomes a lot more profitable, and you're able, to, and even second pair, uh, second pair becomes more profitable. It's it's kind of like every single's hand is just in a blind war, and as well, that's because a lot of times blind wars, the you know person who actually has a pair has the best hand. You don't know how many times I've called down. Uh, I just remember I was looking at the older, I was doing some research, looking at the older threads, and it's like me calling guys down with third pair, and even like value betting the river with it was. It's just kind of and ridiculous to say what kind of reads that I had way back when, and how aggressive I was. I actually don't know. I don't know how many. I don't know how many full-time limit hold'em players we do have on Grinder School. Um, if there's a more interest, then we will definitely start playing. I I can I can make a deal so we can get more limit hold'em videos in. There's a lot of players that would call call these twos. Now I only call these twos if we're getting five to one, and we're only getting less than two to one to call, so we won't call them. Remember, I use the five to one rule. When it comes to pocket pairs, we had twos or fives. We had twos. Okay, I was like, we would have hit quads. It looks like this player is betting a pair. Yeah. So yeah. So keep in mind, this player just likes to bet with air on the flop. Eight, I would have probably raised with ace king there. Although I think I would be ahead. In a tournament, I would call down. Actually, in tournaments, I play ace high. The showdown a lot. I'm gonna be re-raising these eights for value. In fact, if we get three bet here, we could we should be four betting these eights for value. Uh, we have a pair. It's more likely that our opponent doesn't have one, and he's gonna have a much wider range. Now, this is a really crappy board where we expect our opponent to call our bet with buying two cards. If he raises us, which he doesn't do, so I'm actually going to go ahead and check and let him bluff at me. I don't plan on folding after we 4-bet pre-flop. It's extremely hard to put him on a, on a range to 3-bet us without a decent sample. That queen pairing is a good card, although he's going to be trying to value town us with a jack, which is annoying. But he's pretty aggro from what I've seen. So yeah, he he didn't value bet with a jack on the river, although he probably should have. I, uh, I think I'm calling a lot there. Uh, he's not flopping a pair two out of three times, and he's still going to be paying me off when he does flop a pair. So I got to make him pay for the times he does three bet me, and he has uh, his overcards like he will have so often. If he's three betting me with ace jack, and say he's going to be three betting with nines or better, also the number of combinations that he has nines or better on, which is just you know he could also be three betting with any pair actually, and it probably would be a correct play. But let's just say for now that he has nines or better, which means we're we'll be behind to his pairs. Any any three bets with ace jack. He has was it nine, tens, jacks, queens, kings, aces. So six times six. Thirty six combinations of of pairs and forty eight combinations of of over cards. If he's doing ace jack. And that's not including if he's doing king queen. So if he's doing king queen it's another sixteen so that goes it up to 
what, 64? So almost twice as many combinations of overcards as he has as he has pairs. And this is just including if he has King, Queen, and Ace, Jack, or better. This isn't times he's doing this with, like, Ace, 10, or Queen, or I'm sorry, yeah, Queen, Jack, or even the twos through sevens, which we beat. So we should almost always be four betting there, especially out of position, because we lose a lot of value once the flop hits, and we're not able to play. That was a really that was a pretty horrible flop, and if he raised me, I probably would have called. Uh, I probably would have just. I'm I, I'm telling you, I might have just folded right there on the flop. We weren't getting good odds to hit for hit for our eight. Um, we we've already described that we have a strong range, so. See, last time he three bet us with ace jack. Okay, he didn't three bet us this time. It'd be it'd be more interesting for us to play ace queen in this scenario than it is blind versus blind. Blind versus blind play is actually easier, uh, in my opinion, than playing outside blind versus blind because your opponent's range is so much wider, and they you don't have to worry too much about. Your if you have a pair, it's probably going to be good, or you can. It's at least going to be good enough that you can go to showdown. I probably would just. I might just fold ace queen to a check raise here. I don't really see what we'd be out of. He just goes and calls us, and then he leads the turn. This is an interesting play. I'm just trying to think why. They do such a play. It's usually for value, if I remember correctly. Check call, check call, flop, leading turn. I'm gonna go ahead and time bank a, lot, a little bit. I'm not really too worried. About it. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and fold. I don't have odds to draw to the over cards. This is more often like a nine, the tens, or a hand like eights or worse, because he's gonna be check raising the jack on the turn. I was getting two over cards, so I was. Not getting enough. I had six outs, so like 12%. I wasn't getting enough odds to call. I think that I am ahead there a lot, but I think that... Not not a lot, but not too much. I do believe the check call lead turn line... The sole purpose of that is so I don't check behind the turn, which I was going to do. Well, there's two purposes of that. I mean, it's either to prevent me from checking behind the turn, which means it's going to be for value... Or two, it's to take initiative away and just take take initiative away and slow me down and force me to make a decision. And it, as a semi bluff, now he could have what hands would he semi bluff there? It's actually a good question. If he had a hand like, uh, let's, let's say he had a hand like Ace Ten, do you think Ace Ten would lead that turn? It's possible. I'm thinking like he could have ace ten there sometimes, and he could have queen ten. But are there any other? Is he gonna do it with king? I don't know if he's gonna do it with king queen or not. It's it's more of a read based play. And the fact of the matter is, if he does it again, and he keeps doing it, then I'll probably end up showing down ace high with him just to see what he has, so I can make note of it, and then change it later. That's really the only thing you can do. There's really no one has any magical read that. Oh, this guy always has a bluff here. I mean, unless you actually take the time and call him down and spend the extra dollar to do so, then you won't really ever know. I could probably do so for the video. I mean, I probably could have done that just for video's sake and just to, just for fun and see what's going on. But that wouldn't be that realistic if I were to just keep doing that and trying to gather reads. Although, I mean, if again, if you guys if you guys want me to do that in the, in these smaller videos, I have no problem. Um. You guys relying on me to maybe make some marginal call downs that will have cost me a couple big blinds, you know. And if it helps you guys out in the long run, then I'm more, and then I'm much more willing to do so. I mean, it's not that I don't care about the dollar, but I think that as in terms of reads are concerned, that the one dollar it cost me to call down could, in fact, either make me or save me money in the future. And I usually call down quite a bit, although no limit it gets kind of expensive. I, mean, I call down today with like Ace Queen unapproved. Not saying that this I'm not saying necessarily that it was a good play, but so 
So we're going to go about another 10 minutes here or so as I think we're getting into some good content. Uh, another adjustment that I had to make from playing full ring to going to six max was just hyper aggressive players. And even some of the smaller six players, all they do, it, it's, you really don't know if they're just raising to raise or if they're just raising because they have to gamble or if there's a strategy behind it. And it gets really ridiculously tough to find out who's doing what and where. We probably could have called the Jack 10. I wonder what. SS, SSH says about a, a tight game, middle position. Nope. Don't play it. Although it says that we should be playing some suited connectors there in that spot. Then it's suited, then it's suited. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Alright, big blind. We can call the Jack 10 offsuit, I guess. Oh. Okay, I got follow reading SSH here, and it's and I see Jack Ten listed in the big blind against the Rays, and it wasn't. It was just it says remove these hands, remove Jack Ten from your calling range. Okay, so I shouldn't be calling Jack Ten there. Way to go, guys. Way to go. I was going to fold. I'm not gonna lie. I was going to fold before I went and I checked SSH and it said, call it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to call it. What's great about Limit Hold'em is that it's still Hold'em, too. Now, that's going to sound like kind of maybe retarded coming from me, but once you learn one form of poker, it's a lot easier to learn another form of poker. Rather than trying to uh, master four different kinds of poker all at once, if you learn one form r really well, you're actually able to transform and learn another poker a lot quicker. And that's why you see a lot of the higher stakes no limit hold'em pros who are so good at limit ho uh, no limit hold'em that they all, they they can relay that knowledge into hands like pot limit Omaha and you know, even limit hold'em and it becomes less of a, I guess, uh, it becomes more for value and it becomes less of a poker game. It becomes more of a mind game or my, or poker becomes more of a mind game between the two players. No matter if you're playing heads up, it doesn't really matter what game you're playing. Uh, just, you know, the cards are the same, the rules are different, but the two players are the same, so... Uh, I've actually, I've tried some pot limit Omaha. I'm not very good at it, as you guys pro might op probably get. I'll probably get torn down from when uh, I think Shrewdabomb is going to do the pot limit Omaha <laughs> eight or better. Which I don't think I've ever played a pot limit Omaha high or high low game. I played some limit Omaha high low, and uh, limit Omaha high low is. Was used to be quite fun to me. Uh, when I play Limit Hold'em, it was I would play Limit Omaha just to uh, kick back and be like, ah, I got four cards and go that way. Although I couldn't, I couldn't stand PLO for too long. I, I actually like Draw. Draw was a fun game. Uh, it, after a while, though, it gets pretty monotonous, kind of like Blackjack. Although Blackjack, if you're just sitting there having drinks, is a lot of fun too. Draw, I believe, is one of the easier limit, uh, one of the easier hold'em games to master. Like, if you have a good coach, you can master draw pretty easily. It's just after a while, like you know, there's only two street play. So once you master the first street, you know you're already halfway there. So it's kind of like you. And if really, when you're playing like a six-handed draw game, mastering first street is more or less just following a hand chart and you can do pretty well and then on the second street after you draw it's just a matter of do you know win the value bet and um, being able to read what your opponents are drawing I always just love the fact that you know you see players who draw three cards and 
or they call preflop and they just draw three cards and it's like okay, well if I can beat a pair, I'm going to be betting or along those lines. But then again, po- poker is a big part of t- part of it too. So what do we going to do if Lambo decides to check call us and then leaves the turn? Should we raise him or should we calm down? All right, we're going to go ahead and bet. And we'll probably end up having the call a check raise, but we don't get check raised. Should we bet again? Get some value from the draw? I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. There is a there is a chance we get some value there. He's going to have 10 and jack quite a bit. But ace high is going to be good sometime to showdown. Not when he's got ace king, though. Okay, well. So much for that. I figured he wasn't very strong. For some reason, I had a feeling that uh, his range was pretty wide there. and included, like, queen-9, king-queen. Um, didn't expect ace-king. As I usually expect ace-king to raise preflop. If I thought he had ace-king, I wouldn't have bet the turn. Um, because I actually figured that if he had a draw, I would be ahead. He's going to have the flush draw there quite a bit. The jack-10 board isn't exactly my favorite to do a lot of c-betting as a bluff. Uh, you, if I find that like the jack ten boards, should I complete this ace two? No, if I was suited, I would. Uh, so you, I really have to have a reason. Maybe my bet on the turn was pretty thin, pretty thin value. But I think it looks like his range is pretty wide, and I think that I'm still ahead. I don't know how far ahead, but the, the jack ten actually hits quite a bit of pairs, like the queen jack and king jack and ace jack especially. And especially against ace queen is what kills the equity. When you start seeing uh, when ace jack hits hits its pair, it's not really going to be folding. Although these guys are extremely passive and much more so than they are on poker poker stars. I believe the one of my last videos is on poker stars, and I believe those guys were pretty aggressive. These guys are fairly passive, and so when you're playing against passive limit holdem players, it's I I actually believe it's one of the the better games. The ones where they don't re-raise the ace-king and they just let you draw out on them. Alright, well, this guy's short the dollar. I'll re-raise and try to get a heads up with him. Getting it heads up is going to be a lot more beneficial. Hopefully we can raise this guy out of the pot. I don't mind. And then we'll get it in. You only got 75 cents, dude. You should have just capped it on me. We'll get it in, we'll get it in here. Now, the fact of the matter is, should I call or raise? Um, I think he's going to get get it all in either way, so I'm just going to go ahead and get it in now. Where my equity is either going to be its highest or its lowest. And yeah, we don't have much. Yeah, well, we're unlucky that he hits a pair again, so we run pretty bad. My, the other option there was I could just call the flop and then call the turn when he bets. But I don't believe that he's going to be folding regardless. And he should have just four me preflop with his short stack. But I don't expect him to, to really know how to play. Let him hold him, let alone any poker in general. I actually got my first start in Limit Hold'em playing 10 cent, 25 cent on a site called Superior Poker. There was probably 500 players on at, the, at its maximum. And I would play one dollar, sit and goes, for coins. And then you, I'd play. The coins are like satellites, and then you transfer these coins, can t- turn into cash. And uh, once I found FTR, that's how I ended up making some decent money. Before I moved to Party Poker. Okay. Well, preflop right now is gonna be pretty standard call. I don't expect him to be bluffing too much. I think his three betting range, although he's unknown, I'm gonna have to say jacks are better and ace queen and plus and against that range we are absolutely crushed here. Like the only hand that we don't beat is ace queen. And so we were only getting ten to one. We need like twenty two to one in order to call. Even if you can count implied odds of throw another two on there of getting fourteen to one, we really have no option but the fold. Of course, no one my luck he's going to have ace-queen, but wow, that's ridiculous with the fours. He did have tens, so we made a good fold. Pocket fours didn't make such a fold. Pocket fours probably should have raised the turn, and if I had 
tens there. I don't know if I would call the river bet. Uh, I don't know what our opponent would be calling with. I mean, I, I guess he had a good read that our opponent would call barrel on the flop with an under pair, which doesn't exactly make too much sense because our opponent's range, and I guess these guys don't consider range as too much, but you put him on a range pre-flop, and that king jack board completely smacks his range in the head. Unless he's unless he's squeezing with a hand like ace ten and or pocket sixes, I mean, what what the hell are we expecting? You know, unless we're going to be stomach bluffing him off his hand, which I wasn't planning on doing. So let me go ahead and unpost. And so just like in no limit hold'em, go ahead and do some conclusion. Just just like in no limit hold'em, limit hold'em, you have to find ranges too, and. Lately, I've been, you know, people ask, like, well, how do I find a range? Well, first start off with, what are you re-raising with there? And if you're re-raising, say, ace-queen there, no, this is just completely disregarded if it's, if it's correct to re-raise or not there. Okay. Just ask yourself, what are you re-raising there? And is he going to be re-raising more or less than that range? Now, on a side regard, you could ask yourself, what is his what is Correct for him to raise to re-raise there with, given your range and the cold collar and whatnot. And those are two completely different ranges. So start with those two ranges and then work your way work your way into a decent hand range, and then you just try and play a flop. Uh, our opponent's cold call pre-flop of fours was not correct at all. We, he was only getting two and a half to one. And you need five to one in order to make the correct call. Now, once he three, once he got three bet, obviously he has to call and hope he gets the set. But I think his call on the flop is pretty bad too. I mean, like I said, we're hoping that opponent has ace queen there. And let's say that our opponent has ace king and tens are better, like he had. I'm sorry, ace queen tens are better. He's only going to have ace queen roughly. Let's see, there's twelve combinations of ace king and oh. Let's see, three each of kings and jacks. So there's three each of kings and jacks. Twelve of ace king. And then six of tens, right? So he's going to have uh, 12 plus 6, which is 18, plus 6, 24. So he's going to have 24 value ranges. And he's going to have 16 in terms of a bluff range of ace queen. It's actually an interesting spot, but so we know that 16 out of 40 times he's bluffing, given that range. Now, how much equity do we need in order for our for, in order for us to call the flop? Well, let's just go ahead and put him on uh, tens are better, and I'm gonna go ahead and bring poker stove over here. Tens are better, and ace king and ace queen. All right, we're sitting out next hand, and you guys can be doing this a lot too in uh, in limit hold'em because I do this quite a bit in limit in no limit. So let's go ahead and, and give him the board of uh, of what let's kick six of spades, king of clubs, and jack of clubs, and then we have pocket sevens. So maybe maybe it is correct for us to call here. What I'm wondering is, the reason why I'm doing this is because, okay, we have, he's bluffing around 16, 16 and a 40, so that's roughly 40% of the time. He's value betting 60% of the time. Is our value, is our equity when, it, when we're ahead at 40% higher than when we are behind at 60%, given our odds? So we're roughly... Three to one dogs going to the turn. Or equity. And we're getting actually we probably should be calling that. Now that I think about it, eh? Just because of pot odds alone. That's a very interesting decision. It's it's if we had the club, I definitely would like the the call a lot more. Huh. It'll give me something to think about. Uh, you guys, 
give me guys, you give me your guys' input on, on the in the forum, and I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this. Given that we're getting three nine like ten to one to call, and our opponent is bluffing forty percent of the time, if he's if he's betting tens through aces and ace queen, right? Let me make sure I get this right. Oh, I'm sorry. Tens, queens, and aces. There's 18, 24, plus 12, 36. I'm sorry. 24 and uh, 16 divided by 52. Still 3 and a, three and a half to 1. We're getting... And that sounds about right. It's pretty close, guys, whether or not we should call here getting 10 to 1. I'm almost leaning towards the call now, given the given the immense odds and the reevaluating on the turn. If he checks to us, he's probably going to have ace queen. If he doesn't if he doesn't check to us, then he's then he's probably going to have a, a higher percentage hands for value and then we can go ahead and redetermine. But given given the hand range that I gave him, we should be calling this flop bet. And I know it looks kind of spewy given his range, but just the combinations themselves work out given our pot odds that we have to call. Um, so that was a very interesting analysis, and hopefully I don't confuse you guys. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'm going to let you guys go. This has been Code Red Rules coming to you live from Full Tail Poker, doing some limit and hold'em. And hopefully you guys have learned something, I've learned something, and good luck at the tables.